And to another ridiculous debate today, the Albanese government has just passed, you know, the right to disconnect law to stop bosses hassling workers at home with calls and emails. And now it's like, perfect match. It's backing a review by fair work on the right to work from home as well. I think what we need to do is to look for win-win. Uh, we need to look uh, where it's appropriate. Flexibility is fine uh, for workers and, and we encourage that. But in the end, uh, we have to be careful that the Albanese government just doesn't side with the union on every occasion uh, because all that happens is if the price of wages uh, go up too dramatically in an inflationary environment, uh, you'll end up with much higher prices for consumers. Strip this back. I mean, I think Dutton's got a point there. But what is the point of fair work or the government getting involved in this right to work from home issue? If having workers work from home is good for a business, businesses would let that happen. They do that now. In fact, they already do. But why even think of giving fair work, which is a government sort of body, the power to force other businesses to do the same. If they think their workers will actually goof off instead or just be less productive, you know, not sparking off each other in the office. This is yet another so-called reform, like all the others from this union-funded government that makes it harder on bosses and much easier for slackers, easier for the government's public servants especially. Oh, you know what? We will not, we will not have anybody working um, the way that we're going. Um, I think that it's. I think it's great for those that are privileged enough to maybe work in an office to say, "I work from home." <laughs> I just don't get it. That the right to disconnect, the right to work from home. Honestly, I mean, where is the productivity then? Joining me from Danglemar is the Nationals front bencher Barnaby Joyce, the former Deputy Prime Minister. Barnaby, great to see you again. The right to work from home. Now, I love working from home, but in which way is um, that a well, right? Well, it's, it goes down to the person who pays the wages and how they see their rights. Because if the person who pays the wages believes it's a breach of their rights and their capacity to run a profitable business to actually make the money so you can pay the wages, then it's a nil-sum game. For some, yeah, of course they can work from, from home and their, their employer is quite happy for them to do it and that's something they work out between themselves. But uh, for others, to be quite frank, it's homeschooling without the parents. And, you know, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> and then you enter, enter into a dispute with a person from home saying, look, I... I I've got this funny feeling that you're doing the washing, doing the gardening, um, you know, maybe having a look around the house and uh, fixing up a few odds and ends and coming back and doing a bit of work and then going off again. But I don't quite know. But um, I, I'm feeling like you might be ripping me off. And how do we fix that dispute? How do we fix the, the whole purpose of what an office is for so that you, you arrive, you go to work, there's outcomes negotiated, problems are solved, and then you go home. Um, this, this is yet another impost by a government saying, we won't let the employer determine how their business is going to run. We're going to say to the employee, you have a free run at it, and well-meaning doesn't work. It also cuts this working from home business. Like I say, I love it. But for a lot of employers, it's a real challenge. I mean... They don't know exactly how long each job they give an employee will take. Uh, and if the employees are work, they look up, the employee's finished, they're sitting back, they're having coffee. They're, oh, I can give them another job instead of a ring, ring at home. Uh, have you fin Oh, no, I'm snowed under. So, you know, it's just pathetic. But anyway, Barnaby, another issue. Yeah. You've been a surprisingly soft touch at times on refugees. And the government now, though, issuing more than 2,000 visas to Palestinians, most from Gaza, and so very quickly. Does that raise alarm bells even with you? Uh, yes. I remember years ago, right back at the... I think it would have, must have been about 2008, because uh, I had a, a discussion with one of my colleagues. After coming back from Christmas Island, I said, look, there's a big difference between a refugee and an economic migrant. And we've got a lot of economic migrants, uh, people who are coming to Australia, uh, not so much because they're pushed out of their own country, but because, yeah, and I understand it, they see great op economic opportunities to arrive here and they work their way around the system to do it. Now, 
um, no matter how you come here, there's one thing that's absolutely in, written in, in stone, is you must have the capacity to add to our society and not detract from it. You must be a person who does not appear on the crime pages but becomes an industrious person that adds to the wealth of this nation and to the, social, to the civic responsibilities of this nation. Now, if you're not doing the proper checks, you've got no idea who's coming in here. And that is a real concern. And, of course, the issue here is the, what well, looks like hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of visas given to people from the Gaza Strip. Now, I've got no doubts there are genuine refugees, not one doubt in the world. But even then, we have a responsibility to clearly understand who is coming into our nation. Otherwise, you are buying a problem. And when problems occur, it makes it even harder in the future to deal with, with genuine refugees because the Australian people swing against it. And, of course, a lot of Jews are rightly worried with the level of anti-Semitism already here, with so much Jew hatred in that part of the world. Look, some of these people might be, uh, love Jews uh, like, the, like the, their neighbours. Uh, I'm not so sure. I think uh, we've got enough of this anti-Semitism here to, to avoid, you know, we should be avoiding it. I see opposition leader no, Peter Dutton it's, was it, it, it's, campaigning against it's, it's running right. Anti-Semitism is running right. And, and you're seeing a lot of the people it's disgusting. who... disgusting. You know, to be honest, it's, it's, the, it's the strangest thing I've seen in Australia. You've got the, basically, the left wing who always sort of, you know, they're wondrous and they, you know, gender fluidity and pro-environmentalism and anti-Semitism and anti-Semitism. And all of a sudden, it's come out. It's come out. You know, and this is, this is what happens if you, if you cuddle up to the crocodile, one day it eats you. Remember, they weren't benevolent forces. It, it all, in the end, this all comes unstuck. And you're seeing that. And I hope, you know, it, we, our nation moves away from it. And I hope to many others, it's a clarion call, be careful who you're cuddling up to. Absolutely, Barnaby. And later in the show, I'll give you another, well, the viewers, another disgusting example of anti-Semitism. Well, I think it's anti-Semitism. The guy responsible says it's not. It's just anti-Zionist, but I'll let the viewers decide. Barnaby Joyce, always great to talk to you. Thank you so much. I'm with Barnaby. I do not understand what's going on. It's just incredible. How, that, how, this hatred in our streets is so medieval.